today with me, um, we have a bunch of great folks with us um, from across the board. So we have folks that work with developers like yourselves. We have folks from various engineering teams. And we have folks from various product teams. And we have some partners here as well to share just some of the work that they're doing with middlewares and building their applications. Um, so I guess there are a lot of questions I'm expecting today. But I'll also be honest, I have a few of my own. So I just want to probably open the floor, I guess, with the, the standard question that I've always had for these folks, which is, why should we build for ARM? Anyone want to take that? OK, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. It's great to have you all here. Uh, I think it's a good opening question, actually. I think just stepping back there, I think one of the beauty things about the Windows ecosystem, I think we all know, the breadth of diversity and, and the different opportunities then. When you go and look at the ecosystem of devices, there's different devices for different needs, and that's something that we've always stood for. So what do you think about well, how does ARM fit in? Well, it's just like any other device. There's different ways you'd say, how do I evaluate and why would I want this and what are the benefits? And I think there's a couple that right come off the mind, I think, especially for all of us here. If you want to be on the cutting edge, you want to be able to have on-device MPU for AI accelerated workloads, you can do that today. You can do it today. There was a session earlier this morning, Qualcomm presented and shared on their HCX Gen 3 compute platform. You can be able to do generative AI on a device right now. So for sure, this audience, I think, would definitely want to have their hands on a device like that to be able to go look at that on the cutting edge. But of course, just looking at more broadly, if you think about what are all the different reasons or how does somebody consider the device they might want to have or need, you know, a traditional environment like a commercial enterprise, they might look at different devices and say, hey, what is it I need to deploy? You know, what do I what do I value what I have? And there was an example uh, last calendar year where a city group publicly went out and said, hey, look, I'm, I'm making the decision to go and deploy new devices. I'm looking at the landscape of all the different options. I love the Windows ecosystem uh, and the different benefits there. And I'm going to go deploy a Snapdragon device to my, my workforce because I want to have you know, performance and efficiency and these other new types of capabilities that the platform offers. And they did this for multiple reasons, things like uh, I want to have, uh, there's environmental stewardship concerns that I have as a large enterprise, you know, functioning all over the world. And if you look at that, that's that's just like any PC decision is, is, is there's many different reasons for different types of devices. And I think that's the thing we love about the ecosystem. So I think just looking at it like that, it's the opportunity for us here, many of us in your developers, there's new opportunities for devices to have new experiences that never before have been able to go do based off the capabilities of the platform. I think a lot of what we're, we're here to hopefully go answer questions on specifically how do we go do that, but I wanted to just maybe kind of just give us the opportunity of why we'd go do that is there, there are new capabilities that really can exist and exists today. So I think just kind of keeping in mind with that, you know, we can go into more detail, but maybe talk a little bit about how. Thank you very much, Paul. Does anyone else have questions? Because I got a lot. So, it, but I, any? Okay. Let me ask another question. If I wanted to build an app on ARM, do I need a device? Do you want to say that one? Thanks, Shen. Uh, Marcus Perryman. So, do you need a device? Um, obviously, the best experience for a developer is when the loop is the tightest when you're compiling, you're testing, you're deploying. So yeah, the, the best experience is with a local ARM device. And uh, we've been working very hard over the last year to make sure that that's possible to build on ARM for ARM. Uh, but you don't actually have to have a device. I'd recommend it. But if you want to just try it, then you can do that on Intel today or AMD 64. All of them, the majority of our tools today will do a cross compile to ARM64. So if you want to go and build it um, and see if your build chain actually works, you can do that without switching hardware. But what you have to do is think about the testing side of that and the execution side. Um, and that will have to be done on an ARM-capable device. The options you've got today, there's quite a range of devices. Um, my favorite for the last year has to be the Windows Dev Kit 2023. It's based on the Snapdragon HCX Gen 3. It's got a stack of cores. It's got a load of memory, and from a developer's perspective, I love the fact that it doesn't thermally cut my performance. So I can compile till the day is gone, and it's early hours of the morning, and the machine is still running at, at full chat. Um, so yeah, I, I'd recommend having that device, but it doesn't have to be that one. You can test on our Surface Pro 9G, 9 5G, which is available commercially. Uh, Lenovo have a, a great HCX Gen 3 device as well. 
Um, but there's also the, the previous, the Gen 2 devices. Uh, actually, Dell have just announced a really nice uh, low price point Inspiron 14 uh, comes in. I think it's 499. It's retailing out. That's based on an HCX Gen 2 uh, chip. Really nice device. But again, you don't have to buy a device. You could go to the cloud. We have Azure VMs, uh, which will give you a test environment based on our Ampere-based um, server blades. And you can you know, get a, a VM and go and test your apps there. So no, you don't need a device. If you're just looking to try it out, build it on your existing hardware but you do need to test it on an ARM device. If you're going to go long-term, I recommend you get one and start with a dev kit. It's a great piece of kit. All right, thank you. Love me some Windows dev kits. Uh, any questions, folks? You're all very shy today. Either that or you're being very, very generous and letting me ask all the questions. Oh, yes, over there. One second, my friend. Let me get your mic. I'm not a fast runner, but I will try. Okay, what is your name? Uh, Kevin Beery. Uh, do Windows ARM compiles go through the same AOT linker process as OS X ARM builds? It wants to take that one. Do Windows ARM devices go through the same AOT linker process as OS X ARM devices? <laughs> I will quickly swallow my popcorn. Uh, for Emulated applications, we translate on the fly. We do not do the lengthy pre-translation at a first run. If you're talking about native applications, there's no, there's no pre-translation required, of course, because it's fully native. Does that answer your question? Yeah. If you're talking about OS X applications, the, the X64 versions when you're running on the, the Apple Silicon, I'm not familiar with the RID stuff. I just know that if you're Targeting Windows applications, native ARM64, there's no, there's no translation required on the device. Everything's native already. If you're running Intel-based applications, we do translate, but we translate completely on the fly. So, you know, first run, you're going to have a little bit of slowdown, but we save the results of the translation so that on second and subsequent runs, everything is snappy and already fully translated. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Give me a second. Give me a second. I'm getting better at this. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm curious for the partners that are on the panel today, what was the specific use case that kind of drove you to develop and build on ARM? And if you can help us sort of understand what was the decision criteria, uh, that would be really helpful. You want to say that one? Uh, so this was, this was a bit of a planted question. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Max. I'm from Dropbox. Um, so for us, the the decision point was that we had a number of users who were asking for native support, and we had an application that worked for ARM devices, but it was our UWP application called Dropbox Lite. Um, but users wanted sync, they wanted File Explorer integration, and with the, the tool chain changes most recently, it became possible to build a complete app, including shell extensions and process, including a uh, mini filter driver as well, which we, which we use. And so the entire stack was available. And so, um, so we started working on that. Um, and that's still TPD, still in progress, but um, more on that this summer. So that's for us. And now I will pass the baton to other partners, perhaps. There are no partners here. If anybody else wants to say some words, happy to pass the mic or we'll give it to Shen and maybe you can do the next question. Yes, all right. So I guess we've talked a little bit about the why arm and we've talked a little bit about do I need a device? And I guess once I've started building things, like how do I go about testing my application? Um, so yeah, I think we touched a little bit about how you could use a physical device for testing, but I know that's not always accessible for people. So we do have some great testing solutions in-house via Azure um, that can also leverage. Um, one of those is TestBase, which is a cloud-based validation service. It takes care of a lot of the, the setup that's required for VM provisioning and getting the environment set up with the, o the right OS updates. 
Um, and so it does a lot of that for you and you might basically just upload your apps and binaries that you want to test. Um, and then anytime there's a new release of Windows, we will test that for you. So um, we're excited to announce that we are launching a private preview for ARM64 testing within TestSpace. So that's another option available to you. Um, once you do have those ARM apps ready for testing, um, you can definitely leverage TestSpace as part of that. So if you're interested in that, you can definitely come talk to myself or Raji after the, the session and we can tell you more about that. Okay. Hey, Andrea. Yeah, I have a question. We have covered testing and why, but how? If someone wants to develop an application for a Windows on ARM platform, is there any magic thing that needs to be done that otherwise it would be more difficult compared to other platforms, or is it just transparent? From a developer perspective, I mean. Thank you. Oh, Cham, should you want to come around? So I, uh, the way I would think about it is uh, the developer tool chain that we have today, whether it's C++, .NET, Java, um, or any of the other runtimes that you think about, um, all of them started with allowing you to cross-compile your application. As we move towards native tool chains, and now all of these major ones have native versions, um, developer tools like Visual Studio support most of the common workloads. So whether you're using C++, .NET, Framework, modern .NET, so .NET Core, uh, you're using uh, UWP. Any of these will let you easily build your app or retarget your existing app to ARM64. In the case of .NET, if you're using modern .NET and you're compiling as any CPU, it just works. You don't even need to change the target. If you're using .NET Framework, yeah, you need to sure change your target to ARM64, make sure it works. I think the, the key piece there is not just the developer tool chain we build. The piece there is the ecosystem. Uh, most large applications today do not uh, just live in isolation. They pull NuGet packages, C++ applications go to VC package, P, sorry, VCPKG as the package manager. And, and so there is a uh, need to ensure the ecosystem is ready for ARM. And so that's, that's also been one of the areas we've been focusing on. And at least as far as NuGet goes, I think the stats are around 97, 97% compatibility for ARM64. There's the 3% uh, remaining. They have some native dependencies. We have to work with the package owners to get that addressed. Um, and it'll happen. Um, so I, I think uh, coming back to your question, um, is there something, a secret sauce, something special that needs to be done? For the most part, no, it just works. Uh, you have the, the tool chain, you satisfy the dependencies, it just works. You might have some, some nuance, something special in your application, maybe there is a fix needed. Uh, but for the most part, it just works. Thank you, I think that's what I convinced the test team this time as well. It just works in my box. Okay, I think another great topic I think that I was reading up on was RMEC. Um, could someone maybe share a little bit about RMEC? Because we said it just works, right? But then not all of us have things and dependencies that basically run directly on ARM. Is this something that we can talk a little bit about? Yeah. So the, the topic of ARM64EC comes up in a number of places. because uh, well, I'm heavily biased, but I think it's a very interesting technology that we have come up with. Uh, and it comes up mostly from the perspective of, all right, should I be building as ARM64? Should I be building, should I be building as ARM64EC? Um, and the answer is usually if you can build as ARM64, if your entire stack is you can build it as ARM64, that's usually going to be the right option. That's, there you go, that, there's a lot of tools that are mature for ARM64, and that's, that's great, and you can get a good performing application out of that. ARM64 EC really comes up when you have certain cases that are building your entire stack as ARM64 is less possible, and that's where the, the, the transition came in. Um, one of the main ones being if you have third-party plugins that integrate with your application. So Office is a great example of this because it is it is a native app for Windows on ARM, but it's actually built as ARM64 EC because there's an entire ecosystem of plugins, binary plugins that work with Office that you know they exist as x64 and having them continue to just work on ARM64 is extremely valuable. And this is not a unique scenario to Office. A lot of applications out there in the world have ecosystems that moving the entire ecosystem may be challenging. You can build that app as ARM64 EC and host x64 code in that app. There you go, now that just works. Uh, another case where that comes up is dependencies. 
where if you have your entire, if you, again, if you're able to build all the dependencies in your app as ARM64, that's great. Uh, if you have sometimes one dependency that is keeping you held up and is continues to be x64, you could build your entire app as ARM64 EC and continue to use that x64 dependency. This relies on the fact that ARM64 EC has the advantage and the, of being able to integrate or interop between x64 and ARM64 EC code on the fly just seamlessly. So you could keep that one dependency as x64, build the rest of the app as ARM64 EC. So those are two of the biggest scenarios where we end up using or seeing ARM64 EC add a lot of value for people. Uh, but it's it's an option for your application depending on what your application needs to do. Uh, and yes, in the the magic of it just works is uh, again a, my, my heavy bias toward uh, toward the technology where you know you have an app that is running as native code on on this Windows on ARM device and it can load X64. That is really cool to me. I know that is not the driver for why someone builds their app, uh, but I think that is something to to be aware of because it is very cool that it just works. Go ahead. The the question is what is the performance that you see when going you're talking between ARM64 and ARM64 EC? Generally very low. I mean ARM64 EC is in fact is still native code. It's not being interpreted, it's being run directly on the processor. There are some slight differences between ARM64 and ARM64 EC that might impact the performance slightly depending on the scenario you're using. Um, but as a general rule, it's a minuscule compare when you compare it to something like running under emulation, which will have a, a much higher performance effect. Well, just on top of that, are there any gotchas that folks should know about or is it a simple case of just like, go home, try it now and you'll kind of get the right messages if things need changing or not? Is it a simple case of just people just have to try it and then kind of learn about what performance hits look like, if any? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's something where if you have an app that fits the criteria or the scenarios that I was describing for ARM64EC, definitely worth giving it a shot and you'll you'll get to experience it firsthand. I'm not totally sure I understand the question. <laughs> and I admit that uh, in terms of what else you're... you're you're asking, but I'll. There's a couple of things we you need to be aware of for ARM64 EC. Um, it is a separate ABI, so there has to be a binary. If you're using a framework, there has to be a binary from that framework that matches the ABI you're compiling to, in the same way as X64. If you want to use .NET, uh, you have to have an X64.NET framework of, or whatever that matches. If you're compiling for ARM64 Classic. You have to have uh, a matching framework, and it's the same with ARM64 EC. It is a different ABI, uh, and right now there are still some gotchas. It's something that's catching on, and we're we're working heavily to to bring that EC framework to all of the sorry EC ABI to all of the frameworks that people use commonly. Uh, but we're not done with all of it. There's still a journey to go. So just be aware. I'd say that's probably the biggest one that we're seeing folks tripping over, is that they have. Uh, a framework they're using it's not yet ready for ARM64 EC. Now in that case, if there's a hard stop on, on targeting ARM64 Classic, then there are tricks to get around it where you can isolate the uh, components that are causing you to consider EC into a separate process and bring the frameworks into their own process and communicate. Now you can see there's going to be challenges for some folks in terms of the cost. Uh, from a development perspective, but it's something to consider uh, when you're looking at ARM64 EC. Directly from the audience. Hi, I'm John Barry. I'm the dev lead for the team that does ARM64 EC and all of our emulation story. So I wanted to chain on with what Marcus said. ARM64 EC you can think of as x64. The whole magic is that you can basically just smoosh together any amount of ARM64 EC and any amount of x64. So that is the, the benefit. If you don't have something specifically compiled for ARM64 EC, you can just take the x64 version at the OBJ level, at the library level, even at the individual function level if you wanted to. That's 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 what makes it so 
helpful for overcoming those hurdles when you're missing some dependency. So you alluded to something else I think is important that another tactic you can take when you have missing dependencies is to partition things into separate processes because then you could have a mostly ARM64 classic, as we say, application, and then one little host for some piece that you want to run as x86 or x64, because process boundary is magic. So, Thank you very much, John. Um, we have an, a question directly from the audience. Chamsha, do you want to just read it out and answer? The question on the chat is, for .NET Framework, you need to recompile the application for ARM64 to get it to run natively. This makes it harder to deploy ARM64 support for applications that are distributed as any CPU currently. Are you thinking of providing a way to specify ARM64 support in some kind of config file, for example, so that you can keep any CPU exes? Uh, Mark, do you want to take that? Sorry. I can take two. Yeah. Okay. So the short answer is yes. There are some limitations in the way that dot framework assemblies are loaded today that results in us not being able to treat any CPU as ARM64 or an ARM64 device. This is for compatibility reasons. We have a large uh, ecosystem of any CPU applications that were built where developers assumed any CPU would run as x64 because there was no ARM64 back then. Uh, automatic, we could, let's say in theory, roll over any CPU to mean ARM64 or an ARM64 device. That puts a large burden on our ISVs, on our developers, to go and test their application to make sure they work. Some of these applications might be leg legacy applications that have not been built. There's no developer, LOB apps. There's a, there's a pretty large ecosystem out there for apps that, that don't get touched, don't get maintained regularly. And so, so for compact reasons, it's important we don't roll over automatically. So um, hence the current behavior. That said, we are actively thinking about some sort of opt-in, whether it's a config switch, whether it's a flag in Visual Studio, that would then be, that would then be passed on, propagated down to the loader. So we are telling it that it needs to be loaded as ARM64, and any CPU means ARM64. So that's something we're giving active thought to. Um, it's I don't have a date when I can promise that's coming, but it, it's something we're working on. All right, cool. Any questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. So I work for Ampere and um, super interested in what happens on the back end in the Azure cloud. So, Roshni, you talked about test base and the GA for X64, or rather AR64 in this case. Uh, can you speak to, you know, how overall, how seamless that experience is or not, any problems you've run into and how that's going? Sure, yeah, so um, it's the private preview, I have to specify, it's not GA yet, but coming soon. Um, yeah, so far the experience has been pretty seamless. We are integrated with Azure very closely and you know, TestBase is actually built out of Azure Marketplace. So um, all of the VM provisioning and all that kind of works seamlessly. Um, the customer or user doesn't even really have to think about it. Um, we do all of that for them. In terms of differences between obviously Azure you know, VMs versus physical devices, there are going to be differences. And I think that's the case for any sort of you know, cloud testing versus physical de device testing. It's just different. Um, and so that's where I think the combination of having both the Azure environment for testing and then also physical devices would be really important. Um, but overall, I think it's a great alternative, especially when you have kind of got the, the app built and you want to maybe do some more just like continuous testing. Um, it's a great solution and alternative um, once you have that set up so that you can kind of proactively test against any new Windows ARM releases. So um, that's kind of how I see that playing into, you know, the end-to-end -end sort of testing solution. Um, but yeah, overall, pretty seamless so far. Yeah, my name is Raji, and I'm a partner engineering director. I also work on test base and app compat as well, so quite a bit of experience with a lot of stuff that you guys are talking about here. Um, for test base specifically, the advantage that I want to underline that Roshni pointed to is that continuous testing, right? So every time there's a new build that's coming out of our Windows engineering lab, we provision VMs automatically and your applications get tested as part of our release cycle as well. So you get the signals right away and you don't have to continue to go in, you know, very in a ad hoc way, continue to test your application. So I think that is a, a very good way of keeping your applications running no matter what is changing underneath it. So try it out. And again, it's, it's private preview, so 
small number of customers we are taking in at this point for ARM64 support. So if you're interested, Roshni or, or I can get you in. Cool. All right, so I think we started the talk with why ARM? I think I got that. I think we talked about what device do I need? I think we got that. I think we talked about the dev tool chain that I can use once I've got the device. I think we got that. I think we talked about the dependencies I'll probably have that maybe aren't ready yet. So we talked about ARM EC, so we've got that. We talked about how I can then test my application, test space. So I think we've got that. I think the thing I'm now probably missing is at this point, I've still got just my app as it was. But now I want to add some magic to this application. So I've heard a lot about like MPUs and Qualcomm and what we can do there. But like, what, what does that really mean? Like, what does a developer have to do? How easy is it? What's the process? Can someone probably talk a little bit about that from the group? Marcus. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we, you did see this morning, we talked about AI being front and center for Microsoft, and uh, it's quite interesting because when you look at the innovation that's happening, especially in the ARM space around MPU or edge uh, inferencing acceleration, it's pretty exciting. Uh, the, the whole thing about ARM uh, being sort of like a componentized licensed model is driving this innovation, which is brand new. In the, we haven't seen it for many years in the industry, and the MPU is the cutting edge. And the result of that we see in something like the HCX Gen 3 from Qualcomm um, in the Hexagon MPU or DSP. Uh, and the, the capability there is quite spectacular. It's not the only platform uh, which will have these accelerations, but right now it's leading the way. So what can we do with it? Well, we've been trying to figure out the right way to present that to developers, uh, because it's challenging when we start to fragment the space and have you know, a different solution for one set of silicon, uh, and another another solution elsewhere. Um, and we have got a project called Olive, uh, which is what we're recommending developers take a look at. So Olive is based on the Onyx runtime, and it has plug-in providers or a space for that for each of the different silicon vendors to provide the acceleration that's required to drive their particular DSP. Now, today, uh, Qualcomm have their uh, Snappy SDK, which is being developed to fit into the Olive um, uh, API set, which is open source, by the way, so you can go and take a look at it. Now, that's the way we'd recommend uh, developers start to think about how they can adopt uh, these capabilities on the edge. But to give you an idea of what they're capable of, we've developed in the platform something called Studio Effects, which is, uh, it's just on, on a Windows uh, ARM device. If you look at the Surface Pro 9 or the Lenovo X13S, um, and you turn the camera on, those capabilities that affect the video are just running all the time. And the app doesn't really have a huge amount of control over whether it's on or not. That's down to the user. Now, that capability is running uh, both you know, uh, segmentation of the video. Uh, it's, ru it's running the capability then to actually start to zoom and frame the video. It's running uh, a model which looks at the audio and cuts out actively background noise. It's pretty spectacular. I don't know if you saw it last year. But all of those capabilities are running without you know, a breath of, of effort from the CPU. It's all running on the MPU. And it's running at about 50 times less power consumption that we would have if we had to run it on the CPU. So it's, it's great. It's, it's really powerful. Uh, what we do with that Today, we're really just scratching the surface, but there are some fabulous ideas as to how we can continue to innovate, specifically driven forward by the ARM platform and, and the silicon we've got behind that. How do you get at it? Well, if you want to use studio effects in your app, if you want to get like noise cancellation, if you want those video effects, that they're, they're there today. You can enlighten your app um, by becoming ARM classic or ARM native, Let's go with that. Um, and you can use the APIs to integrate and understand whether the platform has that capability and put controls for your users for convenience in there. But even if you haven't got that, your users will still benefit uh, from the platform. If you want to do more, then Olive is the right way to look at things because that gives you the ability to, to actually take your models, optimize them for the right device at the right time, uh, and then get those capabilities running for your application. And it's pretty straightforward to do that today. You have a question? Yep, you did. Thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, thanks, Marcus. So it's the first time I'm hearing about the Olive framework, right? So just for my understanding, so is Olive like a high-level framework uh, which has like a lot of silicon backends? <clears throat> is that the idea? For example, let's say that uh, now we have like a lot of uh, silicon specific SDKs for AI acceleration, right? For example, Qualcomm has their own SDK which can do NPU, GPU, CPU level acceleration. Is Olive trying to fill that kind of kind of fill that gap actually that <clears throat> applications can use the Olive API and the Olive API, a, API can have different silicon backends which can do the silicon. Is is that the idea? All right. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if I should run or not. <laughs> I love it. It's, uh, Shen's my line manager. I love it when I can make him run around the room. <clears throat> He'll get me for that later. But just to answer your question, yeah, you're right. Uh, so Olive, it's an open source project. You can go and look at it today. Um, and the idea is, and it's based on the Onyx, Onyx models. So if you're building your, if you're developing your AI uh, model and then exporting as Onyx, then you can use those APIs in Olive. And we provide in that framework the top level of that. And then there's a plugin layer, which, uh, for example, Qualcomm take their snappy SDK and they develop uh, an Onyx, I can't remember, the uh, Onyx execution engine, I forget. Somebody, execution provider. Execution provider, there you go, that's the term. That then slots in uh, the runtime on that particular platform. So when you think about what you normally do with an Onyx library is you'd optimize it for the silicon you're targeting. In this case, you won't need to do that because we'll do that through the Olive API set. How does that sit with DirectML? So DirectML uh, remains our long-term solution for accelerating. And we'll see over, uh, as we develop the Olive uh, framework, how these things will come together. For those of you who have not seen Build last year and you didn't see Stevie's demo with the long hair and the hair blow uh, hair dryer, it's incredible. I'm so jealous. Uh, <laughs> any questions from the room? No. Okay, folks, I guess just asking the, the, the panel here, I guess we've been on this arm journey for a little while now. What are some of the key learnings that you've had along the way that you could probably share with this audience? Kind of maybe some of the insider stories of like, hey, actually, we were thinking of bar and actually this happened or like we had a conversation on tabs versus spaces and we decided it's all wrong. <laughs> like he wants to go first. High level, we, we don't have too long, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> he knows, he knows. I might be known for taking a long time to speak, maybe. Uh, no, I think just the, the, the short take is, you know, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations we have, you know, many of you, or of course the entire ecosystem working with developers directly to encourage, uh, advocate, and, and really just educate on the opportunities we see. And I think that's, I want to take it to, it's opportunity. And I think when we typically uh, speak to folks are saying, hey, you know, you keep talking about this Microsoft, what does it take or why would I go do this? All the questions we're talking through here. Um, but there's a lot of conversation around um, cost. Well, gee, how hard is it? How much effort do I need to put into it? And so I think a lot of what we've been speaking to here is it might not actually be as much as you think. And in reality, and this is the high level comment I was thinking of was surprisingly, it's usually harder to get approval from maybe management to say, when do I schedule this? Or what release would I go put this into? Or how do I do the validation of this versus what I'm already building if maybe you're migrating? Uh, what I think we all could say is we've had experiences with, yeah, of course there's work involved, but uh, not always as much as you might think. And I think that's the thing I wanna go just in part of, you know, into folks' minds is just start looking at it and then you might realize, well, for sure, uh, there are some things you might need to go do, but it, it might not actually be as much just net new development uh, as you might think there'd be. But I think that's if that's the cost side, it's the opportunity side. Rather than framing it with cost, I think one of the things that's been most rewarding is when you're actually talking with folks and they say, you know, how do I do it or what do I need to go do to make it work? And then it's say, oh, now that I've done this, these are some of the other things I'm able to go do. And I think why we're so excited and talking a lot about AI and MPU is it is a gateway to hardware we have here right now that you can go touch, you can go buy, you might already have them, and you can go use them to do incredible things. Uh, and, and it's just just the beginning. And so this is where there is new opportunity. There might be things you're already doing. You might be doing things in the cloud. 
you can start thinking about, or you should start thinking about, how can I go leverage the local device and what are the appropriate parts of an application or things that you can do locally? And I think that's the opportunity side to it. And I think so the, the learnings from all the different conversations is uh, th there's there's more upside than you might think, and the downside is not actually as much as you might think. And so I think that's one thing we just want to get that message out. That wasn't too long, was it? No. <laughs> so for me, um, realization that actually building code on an ARM device. So let's say the Windows Dev Kit 2023, and I was going to go and get mine out, but I've just seen Jamshed's got his out, so <laughs> he can wave it around. Um, it's the only platform that Microsoft has where you can build and test for all of our CPU architectures mm. is on our ARM device. And I find that quite mind-blowing because you can't test an ARM64 app on an Intel machine, but I can test an Intel app on an ARM64 machine. And I think that's great. Why aren't we all doing it? It's the one place to go. I kid you not, today I, we were talking about this this talk before coming in, and Mark says, well, don't worry, I've got my dev box. And I'm like, you got what? And he just pulls it out of the bag, and it's this thing. It's really incredible and quite small. So it's it's impressive compared to how much budget I must be spending on all the other dev boxes, Marcus. Um, <laughs> all right. Any other questions in the room? Yeah. The one thing I wanted to add as a, you know, a learning or an insight from being on this project for, for so long is we've had the opportunity to see technologies and things go from not supported and it'll never be supported on ARM to suddenly, well, it works, to, well, it works well, and now it's actually, you know, there's a big investment in making it work better. And I'm not going to name any specific projects, because, but there's a lump because it's a long list. Um, but, you know, in the, it was early days, it was viewed as it's just never going to happen. And I... I love the idea that that's, <laughs> that's been proven untrue and that we are continuing to make this, these steps forward and we have a lot of momentum. And so there are plenty of other things that right now seem like they're not going to happen, but maybe they will. It's, and uh, I'm really enjoying seeing that transition happen and, uh, over, over the course of the last few years. All right. It's my last run, I think. Yeah, we, we have been working for the last one half year with Marcus in supporting and enabling some of the additional languages and packages that are traditionally open source and porting them as native for Windows on ARM. And it has been surprisingly simple. Uh, and for example, we are maintaining a LLVM for other OS platforms and enabling it for Windows on ARM. Uh, it took less than a couple of weeks part-time to an engineer for the first just heavy LLVM for Windows on ARM. And the challenge was more setting up the CI, exactly, and coming back to your point, setting up CI so that we can verify all the test results and say, yeah, this, is, this can be considered an official LLVM release because it passes all the required testing. So setting up the CI platforms and making sure that the test results were accepted as, as good official results, that has been the, the challenge that we accomplished rather than porting which I think is a very, very positive, encouraging result. It's more about the infrastructure than, than no, no main differences really in the work. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe just a couple minutes. Yeah, that's, thank you so much for the feedback. That's exactly why we're working very hard on what kind of tools and technologies we need to develop to address that problem. But I do want to plus one what Mark just said. You know, I've been working on this project on the app compat side as well for quite a while. And it's just been lovely seeing how much we have, you know, our, our partners around the company have rallied together to make sure that the technology that we are building is pow powerful enough that you know, applications just work and it's it's simple for developers to go build for ARM and make ARM applications uh, work for our customers. So it's just been a wonderful journey and I'm very happy that we're all here and we're behind this uh, this technology. And I'd love to, for the infrastructure piece, let's chat if there's anything that we can do to help you out. I'd be happy to engage. Just want to add to that a bit. Um, in addition to uh, ready services, package services like test base, if you're thinking about just, if you have a bespoke, bespoke system today uh, in-house, uh, CI, CD, 
um, you can use Azure VMs and get your system working on ARM64. If you're using Azure DevOps, they already support agent pools that are running ARM64 VMs. If you're using uh, GitHub Actions, they have shipped a preview of self-hosted runners um, using uh, supporting ARM64. Uh, Cloud Hoster is not available yet. That's work in progress coming at some point. But you can get started with self-host using Azure VMs today. So the foundational blocks are there, and it's a matter of putting the pieces together and kind of getting it to a great experience. All right, folks, so we are at time. Thank you so much for attending. Um, and hopefully you had a great session. Um, as always, these folks will be around if you need time after. Thank you.